So good evening, everyone. And welcome to the 2019 Lionel Gelber Prize Lecture and Award Ceremony. Founded in 1989 by the Canadian diplomat Lionel Gelber, the Gelber Prize is a literary award for the world's best nonfiction book in English on foreign affairs. The award is granted to a book that expands our understanding of pressing international issues. The award is presented annually by the Lionel Gelber Foundation in partnership with Foreign Policy Magazine and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. To begin, I'd like to recognize Patricia Rubin. Patricia is the niece of the late Lionel Gelber, and she serves with distinction as the chair of the Lionel Gelber Prize Board. She is a renowned solicitor and a great friend of the Monk School. And we deeply appreciate the astute leadership and great support that she lends to the prize. I'd now like to invite Patricia Rubin to share further details with us about the prize and the man whose name stands behind it, Lionel Gelber. Patricia. Good evening, and a very warm welcome to you, and in particular to our 29th Lionel Gelber Prize winner, Professor Adam Tews, the author of our prize-winning book, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. Last year, when we celebrated the Lionel Gelber Prize, by coincidence, on April 17th, we were in the midst of an ice storm. This year, the weather is fine. But having previously heard Professor Tu speak, I can promise you our own private tempest of facts, opinions, and masterful storytelling. We are in for a treat. Most of us here tonight know what the Lionel Galber Prize is. Our mission statement is that the prize is a literary award for the world's best nonfiction book in English on foreign affairs that seeks to deepen public debate on significant international issues. In his book, Crashed, Professor Tews remarked that the city of London was like the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club, the hosts of Wimbledon. The setting, he said, is quintessentially English, but it's a global tournament. If I may adapt that phrase to our present purposes, I would say that the Lionel Gelber Prize is quintessentially Canadian, but it too is a global tournament. Few book prizes in Canada have its reach or its longevity. To achieve the goal of celebrating international excellence by global affairs writers requires a lot of preliminary careful planning and wise decision making. As I've said in the past, the respect and renown of the prize rests on the shoulders of our jury. I wish to thank Professor Randall Hansen, the interim director of the Monk School of Global Affairs for his wise selection of the distinguished international jury, which this year included two former Lionel Gelber Prize winners. You will hear more about the jury members in a moment. But I would like to commend the jury under the chairmanship of Professor Janice Stein for selecting not only our prize winner, but the four other remarkable books on the shortlist. Excuse me. Janice Stein, as many of you know, is not only the founding director of the Monk School, but is also a long-standing friend and advocate for the Lionel Gelber Prize. She understands the special attributes that our winning books have, authority, originality, significance, and readability. Adam Tooze's book is an illustrious example of the winning books which have been awarded the Lionel Gelber Prize over the past 29 years. Lionel Gelber, much like Adam Tews, was thoroughly at home with policy and problems on both sides of the Atlantic. Between 1930 and 1938, Lionel lived in England, first as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and then as a writer in London. His first book, The Rise of Anglo-American Friendship, was published in September of 1938. He went on to write five other books and many scholarly articles while living in England New York, and Toronto. As an historian, Lionel believed that it was the task of historians to ensure that great issues do not vanish. I believe he would be overjoyed to know that this book of such profound scholarship and comprehensive scope 
dealing with the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2008, has been awarded the Lionel Gelber Prize. Our podcasts are often our first introduction to the shortlisted authors, and I would like to commend Rob Steiner, Director of Fellowship in Global Journalism and Professor of Global Practice at the Monk School, for the insightful interviews he has had with our shortlisted authors. Rob has said, it's an honor each year to play some role in connecting Lionel Gelber's leadership with the leading thinkers of the current moment. Thank you, Rob. I truly enjoy your podcasts and recommend them to all of you. Special thanks to funding media partner, Focus Asset Management, for their support of these podcasts, which are available on iTunes. Special thanks also to June Dickinson for her terrific job as publicist for the prize. We greatly appreciate your hard work, professionalism, and yes, your success. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Randall Hansen and his colleagues at the Monk School, particularly Amanda Martin, a congenial and always helpful associate, and Stacey Belmare for their able administration of the prize and the prize ceremony. Finally, my personal thanks to the prize board, Professor Randall Hansen, Professor Ron Levy, Sarah Charney, Noah Rubin, and Adam Charney for their active participation in ensuring the ongoing well-being of the prize. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a most interesting evening. Thank you, Patricia. I'd like now to introduce our jury. The prestige and renown of this prize means it's very, very easy for me to put together uh, a selection of outstanding people. And they are Janice Gross-Stein. Jury chair is the Belsberg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. She is fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received an honorary doctorate of laws from four universities is an, and is a member of the Order of Canada, our highest civilian honor, and the Order of Ontario. And she is a major public intellectual and a frequent contributor, frequent contributor to CBC and TVO. Anne Applebaum. Anne Applebaum is a columnist for the Washington Post and a prize-winning historian with expertise in communist and, no, and post-communist Europe. She's also a prof professor of practice at the London School of Economics, where she runs ARENA, a research project on disinformation and 21st century propaganda. She is the author of several books, including Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, which won the 2018 Lionel Gelber Prize. Anne is a former member of the Washington Post editorial board, a former deputy editor at Spectator, and a former Washington correspondent of The Economist. And as many of you know, all of you know, I suspect, she writes regularly for the New York Review of Books, Foreign Affairs, and many other publications. Sir Lawrence Friedman. Sir Lawrence was professor of war studies at King's College London, between 1982 and 2014, and vice principal at the college from 2003 to 2013. He is now emeritus professor there. Before joining King's, he held research positions at Nuffield College, Oxford, and the Royal Institute of International Affairs. In 1997, he was appointed official historian of the Falklands campaign, and in 2009, he was appointed to serve as member of the official inquiry into Britain and the 2003 Iraq War. His book, A Choice of Enemies, won the 2009 Lionel Gelber Prize and the Duke of Westminster Medal for Military Literature. His most recent book, The Future of War, was shortlisted for the Lionel Gelber Prize last year. Shalini Randiria. Shalini Randiria is rector of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and professor of social anthropology at the Graduate Institute of International and, Developmental Stu and Development Studies in Geneva, as well as director 
of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy. She serves on multiple boards, board of, the Board of Trustees of Central European University, the Academic Advisory Board of the Vienna Museum, and the Advisory Board of the Higher Education Support Program of the Open Society Foundation. Finally, Frank E. Sisson. Frank Sisson is the director of the Petro Yatsik Center for Ukrainian Historical Research at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies and a professor in the Department of History and Classics at the University of Alberta. He is head of the Executive Committee of the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium at CIUS, and he's taught at Alberta, Harvard, Columbia, and Stanford, along with many other institutions. He's a specialist in East Central European history, Ukrainian historiography, early modern Ukrainian political culture, and modern Ukrainian religious history. And I'd now like to turn the floor over to our founding director and jury chair, Janice Stein. Thank you very, very much, Randall. And it's, of course, a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Adam Tews to the Lionel Gelber ceremony. Uh, just before I say a little bit about the shortlisted books, uh, let me just echo Randall's words. I mean, this was a truly wonderful jury. Um, two former winners, so you ha they had to meet the standard of a superb book. They were invested themselves in the quality of the prize. We coordinated calls between London, Bangkok, and Toronto. If you think about the time difference here, some people uh, were more awake uh, than others, depending on when we did our calls. But we actually had a wonderful time working together because of this rich menu of books this year. It's a very different list when you look at it. Um, Rania Abu Said's book, No Turning Back, uh, Life, Loss, and Hope in Wartime Syria, is a, is a very personal account. Uh, Rania is a journalist and writes with immediacy and passion uh, about the everyday lives of Syrian protesters and killers and the victims and how they interacted together. Um, it's powerful, it's moving, uh, it's gripping, and for anybody who is interested in probably what is the greatest humanitarian catastrophe and political catastrophe of this last decade, uh, it's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful book to read. It, it, it took me three days to find her, to tell her that she was shortlisted, uh, because she was, at the time, somewhere in Syria. And that gives you a sense. Uh, Elizabeth's Economy um, wrote the third revolution, Xi Jinping and the new Chinese state. Uh, you know, Adam had a long piece in the Globe uh, this past weekend, which I hope you all saw, uh, which speaks to some of the issues, frankly, that Elizabeth Economy writes about in her book. And what she argues in a very strong way is that the Chinese state is back, frankly, if it ever went away. It's not clear that it ever did. Um, it's a really um, important book because it's so granular in its description of Chinese businesses and the environments in which they work. Um, and frankly, uh, I and the rest of the jury came away from reading that book pessimistic uh, and alarmed uh, about where China is going. And I see Rob Steiner, who did the podcast, nodding his head there. The third book, um, was Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt's How Democracies Die. And Adam, you had very stiff competition because it was on President Obama's annual reading list this year. So that went in. You, you can understand why that seems to give a starting advantage to a book in a competition. 
Um, it's a terrific book, frankly. It's a courageous book um, that deals with what is a worry probably to all of us in this room, the state of American liberal democracy. And what they do in the book is they actually look at democracies that have failed. And it's a very, again, these were sobering books uh, to read. There, it was not a happy year, let me put it that way. It was very hard to find even one happy story at all among any of these five. That's the thread, I think, that unites all of them. Um, and they're, they're very clear-eyed that no democracy is safe, um, even the best institutionalized and the oldest. Um, and they move on to what needs to be done to shore up the foundations of Western democracy at this moment in history. So it's a compelling read. And then um, Timothy Snyder's book, um, whom I assume you know well, Adam, <laughs> a fellow historian uh, who writes with a very, very distinctive voice. Um, this is not a shy man, uh, is all I can say. He wrote The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, and America. And in Anne Applebaum's words, uh, this is a book about, and these are her words, because I could not have written them, frankly, the sinister philosophy underlying Russian authoritarianism. Uh, this is a book by somebody who sees the long trajectory of Russian history, uh, sees it repeating itself in different ways and in different forms, and is deeply worried about the Russian capacity to disrupt uh, the tools of the weak, frankly, um, and it is a very powerful, powerful statement. So for people who are interested, it's a wonderful book to read. Now, last is Adam Tooze's book, and I had a minute to talk to Adam uh, before we came into the room, and I said to Adam that, frankly, you made our job easy. Uh, even though the other four books, and I can commend all of them to you, the jury came together without any meaningful dissension around crashed how a decade of financial crises changed the world. Um, this is, in some sense, as Adam argues in the book, the seminal event um, of the last two decades. We are still dealing with the aftershocks of this event. Uh, it has rippled across so many issues in so many ways. And what Adam does is paint, first of all, and, and for a fellow academic, he writes beautifully. Um, you know, the historians really do have an advantage over the social scientists, I'm, I'm forced to acknowledge. Um, you just, you write much better than we do. Uh, and this, this is a gripping read. It's not short, but it's really a page turner. And the jury took seriously the Lionel Galber Prize that this is, it needed, the, the, the prize is animated really fundamentally by the belief that intelligent lay readers uh, matter. And your book speaks exactly, I think, to that audience. This is a, Chilling tale, I think, of how banks failed to manage risk, um, how the crisis almost fractured the Eurozone. But what Adam does in Crashed, which, which makes it uh, really a singular book, and I urge every one of you in this room to read it, he draws the threads that connect um, events that are not obviously connected but we all know about them, but we did not connect them in the way that you do, Adam, in the book. Um, and the jury was unanimous um, in coming to the conclusion that this will remain a standard work, um, largely because of your reach and your capacity to draw these threads for readers like the people who are in this room. Every member of the jury joins me in congratulating you for an absolutely 
superb piece of work. Thank you. Great. Uh, before I uh, introduce our, our winner and our speaker, just a little bit of logistics. Um, after his uh, talk, he's kindly agreed to take questions. We'll be passing out cue cards, so please jot down your questions. Those will be collected, and we'll have a Q&A here afterwards. Now, this year's winner is a highly distinguished historian whose previous books were paradigm shifting. His second book, Wages of Destruction, The Making of the Nazi Economy, transformed scholarly understandings of Germany and the German economy during wartime, of the economic limits placed on Germany's war of extermination, and of the effectiveness of the Allied bombing campaign. It won the Wolfson History and Longman History Today book prizes. His next book, Deluge, The Great War, America, and the Remaking of the World Order, was published to similar acclaim, winning the Los Angeles Times book prize. His recent book, the book we're discussing tonight, continues in that tradition of excellence. It is, quite simply, magisterial. The book provides a global history of the most defining economic event of our lifetime, the crash of 2008 and the Eurozone crisis of 2010 to 2015. The book demonstrates a mastery of the most complex details of macroeconomics and finance. It lends the reader a retrospective fear, even horror, for it demonstrates how close the world came to total economic collapse. And in the very best traditions of the Gelber Prize, it combines the highest scholarly standards with fluent, indeed, engaging prose. This is over 600 pages of complex economics that reads like a thriller. The author of this tremendous work is the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History at Columbia University. He completed his undergraduate degree at King's College, Cambridge, very appropriately, the College of John Maynard Keynes. He wrote his doctorate at the London School of Economics under the supervision of the great economic historian, Alan Millwood. And before taking up his current position, he held tenured posts at Cambridge and at Yale. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you one of the finest historians of his generation and the winner of the Lionel Gelber Prize, Professor Adam Tews. Good evening. Uh, you, will, you will understand that I have a lot of thank yous to say. Um, first of all, to the, to the Gelber family and to Patty Rubin in particular for your generosity and initiative in creating this prize and for the encouragement that it gives to people like myself engaged in this business. Uh, I'll come back to that at the end of my talk today. To the Monk School and to Randall Hansen for his extraordinarily generous introduction, and to Professor Stein and the, as everyone has said, remarkable jury. Um, it is an absolute uh, honour to have been chosen by them. And then I would like to thank Stacy and June. Where's the are they? Okay, for the for your hospitality over the last day and for making uh, my travel to Toronto as as pleasant as it has been. I have to say that receiving this award uh, is a wonderful surprise. Um, as a historian, you don't necessarily expect to receive a major literary prize for a book on foreign affairs that seeks to deepen public debate on significant international issues, as the purpose of the prize is defined. But perhaps in times like these, one should be less surprised. In times like these, we do, after all, tend to turn to history for orientation. But I have to say I'm surprised nevertheless, in part, I think, because I don't take the relevance and usefulness of history for granted. 
It may be true that in times like these we turn to history, but that trite statement begs the question of what kind of history we turn to. What kind of history is useful? Not all history is. Even when it isn't fake history, even when its authors have the best intentions. In a moment of crisis, there's a natural tendency for all hands to want to scramble on deck. We see a kind of self-mobilization of the intellect. Historians who know something about previous moments of crisis naturally feel particularly called upon to pitch in. Warnings are issued. Lists of lessons are proffered. And I say this with particular emphasis because, as Rand pointed out, my first three books dealt with Germany and Europe between 1914 and 1945, so there was more than enough crisis in my head to go around. The temptation for that kind of move was obvious, I think. But the book that you're honoring this evening is not a history of the interwar period. What I wrote instead was a thoroughly contemporary book. I hope, at least, it is. In fact, Crashed is a book without much historical depth, in the conventional sense. It deliberately abstains from deep historical references. Why? It goes back for me to a basic question of how we think about history. And I want to start today's talk by laying this out for you, even if it's perhaps a little bit crude or as a philosophy of history goes, even hokey at times. I think it's important to understand this starting point to really be able to understand what I was trying to do in this book. For some, history is a giant repository of case studies and examples, a source of data sets, and as it said in the new jargon, uh, natural experiments. For others, it's an arena in which they believe they can make out great repeating patterns, the rise and fall of empires, globalization, and backlashes against globalization recurring over time. And it's from this point of view that it makes sense to study, say, for instance, as the subtitle of a bestseller of the crisis went, 600 years of financial folly, recurring over time as people become excited about financial assets. And we have the Dutch tubit bubble and the railway booms and then on to the crises of the present day. It makes sense also, and this is the distinguished tradition of political science, to draw lessons from earlier epochs about how to deal with populism or how democracies fall into crisis. But I wonder whether it's not a bit optimistic to imagine that deep truths of human nature can be so easily discerned in the historical record. And I wonder what price we pay for the analogies that enable us to leap from one period of crisis to another. To draw the conclusions that they do, it seems to me that such narratives, such historical accounts, history that is trying to be useful, has to operate at a level of abstraction that renders many of its claims really rather empty one ends up deriving conclusions that are a bit like blaming gravity for an airplane crash or a spark for a terrible fire. Sure, of course, gravity plays a role in most airplane crashes and sparks start fires. But try telling that to the grieving and angry survivors of such an event. It's not what they're interested in. And the same is true when financial bubbles came crashing down. Sure, human nature and its speculative impulses may play a role, and the bursting of those delusions is a common fate of humanity, perhaps. But anyone, I would argue, who's satisfied with that kind of answer, perhaps particularly in the financial realm, must have their own reasons for wanting to stay on the superficial surface of things. Mark Twain allegedly said that history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. What I like about that line is that it points to relationships and intelligible logics of connection which aren't replication or repetition, or may not even, in fact, in their basic logic, be apparent to us immediately. But even the notion of history rhyming may be a little bit too rationalistic. Certainly, the image of the poem suggests far too much closure. History, I would argue and submit to you, doesn't have the formal properties of a poem. It's more like a giant babbling conversation spreading, increasing in volume and diversity to become the vast, infinitely complex cacophony that confronts us today. It's open-ended, interconnected, but constantly shifting and mutating in the very logic of its interconnections. Past statements and actions condition the present and the future, but in a shifting, evolving, and dramatically expansive way. Let me translate these rather abstract ideas 
for you into something very much more concrete. And let me do that in the manner of an economic historian. What does this giant babbling conversation look like when an economic historian comes to approach and study it? Well, I would submit that it looks something like this. This is the track of GDP per capita as far back as we can measure it. The timeline along the, along the bottom are millennia. This is what economic history thinks the history of humanity has looked like since the birth of Christ. You can see it's a very dramatic story, but one that starts very late in the day. In fact, if you want to make a more intelligible statement about modern history, because otherwise you're basically talking, well, this is actually a topical reference. This is what economic historians call the hockey stick um, here, for obvious reasons. If you want to unpick it in a more meaningful way, this is the moment at which the story really becomes significant. You could, of course, choose to treat the experience of humanity and history in the 18th century or the early 19th century and the 20th century alike as moments in the human story whose essentials are the same, and then jump from a moment here to a moment there and say, well, what draw conclusions could we draw? And one can do this, which is why, for instance, Jane Austen still speaks to us, writing at the beginning of this curve to audiences at the end of it. But you would, of course, be ignoring the obvious, that material conditions today are radically different and getting more so by the day both for better and for worse. The internet on the one hand, climate change on the other. There may be repeating cycles in this data, though you can't see them at this level of resolution, so let us beam in one degree further. This is just the United States from the late 19th century, and you begin to be able to see something which isn't just trend, isn't just spectacular economic growth. This is America's economic development since the late 19th century. There may be repeating cycles in this data, but fo focusing on them in extraction from the gigantic expansive growth process is surely to miss the wood for the trees, to confuse noise and message. What story should historians ultimately tell about this graph? Should they be focusing on the fact that these cycles return, or should they be focusing on this huge expansion which clearly dominates the picture? Comparing a crisis here at the beginning say, of the early 20th century, with one at the beginning of the 21st century is clearly possible, but it would, in medical terms, be like conflating a case of childhood measles with a massive middle-aged heart attack. Both may be incapacitating, even life-threatening, but they have very different meanings, very different medical significance. Undeniably, of course, the path to the financial crisis of 2008 goes through 1929, in the same way that you have to survive your childhood measles to be able to survive your middle-aged heart attack, you cannot get to the latter without surviving the former. But the teenage measles are hardly the obvious place to start to understand why the bloated middle-aged businessman's heart stopped. Instead, start by asking why he gave up soccer in his 30s, why he's under so much pressure at work, why his wife left him and his teenage kids are driving him crazy. In the same way, if you want to understand 2008, don't start in the 1930s, start in middle age, in the 1970s, from which period the dynamics which shape our current world issued. That, by the way, is also suggests the limits of our reforming ambition in the aftermath of those two crises. The teenager once over the measles is still heading into the prime of their lives. After the 1930s came Bretton Woods and the post-war glory days. The same prospect may not be open to us um, suffering the crisis that we did at the beginning of the 21st century, and that is a question where China comes very much to the center of our considerations. The only bad thing about this analogy, illuminating as it is up to a point, is that it suggests that the history of financial capitalism has a definitive ending. After middle age, after all, comes something else. But I don't want to commit myself to that at this point. This is really just a helpful device. So now to history, what do we actually see if we take this more historically focused diagnostic approach to the crisis of 2008, starting not in childhood, starting not in the 1930s, but starting with its immediate prelude in the period from the 1970s onwards. What we see if we approach the history of the last half century of the global economy with 2008 in mind is the extraordinary expansion of transnational financialization, and in particular, the expansion of market-based banking on both sides of the Atlantic from the 1960s. 
It was an absolutely massive force. It knitted the world economy together in a giant credit flow, which spread around the world into Latin America and Asia, and after 1989, after the Western victory in the Cold War, into the former communist territories too, both in Eastern Europe and in Asia. That credit flow also, of course, created the potential for massive financial instability, a running series of heart attacks that began in the 1970s after the hiatus of the stabilization period of the post-war period. You see this huge surge here in the frequency and incidence of financial crises, which forms the prelude to the event on which Crush focuses our attention. It was to contain this bout of turmoil that the Europeans set to work to create the Eurozone. This made the European currencies less vulnerable to shocks, but that, it turned out, was to address the symptoms, not the cause. The creation of a single giant currency zone unleashed an extraordinary expansion of debt in Europe. Greece was made into the symbol of that boom and bust. It was the poster child, we were told, for indiscipline enabled by the incomplete euro, which lacked rules. But beware the obvious. Look with suspicion at the person telling you it was gravity that brought the plane down. The indiscipline in, Bre in Greece concerned mainly its public debts. But in that respect, it was highly unusual. In the Eurozone as a whole, public debt as a share of GDP is the red line bouncing along the bottom. Almost incredibly different from the standard narrative of Europe's development from the early 2000s onwards. There is, in fact, no increase in the share of public debt in European GDP over this period. Why? Because GDP growth, the denominator, was brisk, driven by a huge inflation, not in public, but in private credit, which is the blue line surging ahead in the early 2000s. In other words, <coughs> if the prelude to the crisis of 2008 is a story of runaway banking finance, it's a story that's as much European as it is American. And in fact, in relation to the size of the European states, it's dramatically more dangerous in Europe, as we should see after 2010, than it was in the US. The real estate booms in Ireland and Spain were in fact proportionally twice the size of those in the United States. You can see this if you look out on the end here of this graph. This is the expansion of credit relative to GDP. This is the expansion of house prices relative to GDP. You can see Canada and the United States in the period between 01 and 06 comfortably nestled down here. I'm afraid to say that Canada has subsequently moved up here. But up to 2006, you can see Spain and Ireland as the runaway winners of this global context, a contest of uh, financial irresponsibility. Strikingly, all of this went on remarkably little remarked upon before the crisis. In the 1990s and the 2000s, for obvious reasons, all eyes were on China. And this is an instance, I think, of being wrong for focusing on the right story. Because even though China is obviously the defining crisis or the defining challenge of our generation, and I hope in the Q&A that we will come to talk about it more, even if that is the case, financial globalization was not, as you might imagine, above all a Pacific phenomenon. It was above all a North Atlantic phenomenon. And I have to say that in doing the research for the book, stumbling upon this particular chart or this particular image produced by the BIS in 2007-8, that's the Bank of International Settlements, the club of central bankers, was perhaps the single most shocking event. And it was when I saw this that I realized that I had a story to tell that was distinctive, but also that related deeply to my earlier work on transatlantic international relations. What this chart shows you is that if you were a Martian and you came down from space in the early 2000s and were asked to define where globalization was taking place, you would have despite the implausibility of this message, to conclude that it was happening above all in Europe. The center of financial globalization was Europe, with flows out of Asia, uh, in and out of Europe, uh, uh, to the United States. And if this is true, if financial globalization was centered above all in the North Atlantic, so too was the crisis of 2008. As Ben Bernanke said, and we have to take him, I think, absolutely literally here. September and October 2008 was the worst financial crisis in global history, including the Great Depression. This is a truly shocking statement to make. 
How can this be true? Well, it's because simultaneously on both sides of the Atlantic, in September 2008, we were facing the implosion, not just of the American banks, the famous names are here, but the entire Western banking system alongside the United States, the banks of Britain, uh, of Switzerland, of France, of Ireland, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, South Korea, and Russia, all quaking as they never had before, all threatening uh, imminent financial collapse. This is perhaps the scariest single chart that I produced, not the most illuminating, but the scariest, which shows uh, this is again from the BIS, produced in the sense that it was found. I found it in the remarkable reports that that center of expertise has produced, uh, both in the run-up in the aftermath of the crisis. This is gross financial flows, so flows in and out of the world's economies. Um, and you can see this enormous collapse. And as I'm stressing here, what it's driven by is not a collapse in the relation between the West and Asia, but entirely in this gray bar here, which is north-north, advanced economy to advanced economy financial flows. This is, in other words, a sudden massive heart attack of the North Atlantic financial system. So we were confronting, in 2008, the single most catastrophic collapse of the financial system that we have witnessed in the long history of capitalism. But no, no less significant is the fact that unlike after 1929, the collapse did not widen and spread and become lasting. The story that I tell in Crashed, the history of the crisis of 2008 and its aftermath, unlike the history of the Great Depression, is the history of a crisis contained, not so much, in other words, a nuclear apocalypse as a Cuban missile crisis. This doesn't make it insignificant, but it was a near-death experience rather than an actual fatality. How was it contained? The short answer is prompt and massive emergency action. When the financial heart stopped in 2008, the central bankers charged the paddles and applied them to the dying patient with massive force. And the man who led this and who earned himself in the, in the context of the crisis, the extraordinarily improbable accolade, because you will never meet a man with less charisma than Ben Bernanke, but in the course of the crisis, and a very deliberate, and I believe, in fact, this is almost a tactical move on his part to be, as it were, uh, this sort of uh, extraordinarily passive figure at the heart of the crisis. What the uh, central banks did was to engage in the most single, most dramatic uh, single expansion uh, that's ever, uh, been, uh, ever seen in the history of the world economy, a huge expansion of their balance sheets. Why did they did th do this? Well, in part, it was precisely because Ben Bernanke and his colleagues learned something from history. They knew, to switch metaphors yet again, that when a plane stalls, whether it's a wooden biplane or a modern jet, it's best not to fight the spin, but to go with it and to dive out. Central bankers, for their part, since they've been flying the aircraft of modern finance, which is broadly speaking since the 1850s, the mid-Victorian era, have learned a similar lesson. They've learned that when liquidity stops, when interbank lending dries up, the central bank must stop in, step in and lend. It must lend into the storm. If they do, they may change the course of the crisis. If they succeed, there will be one less data point in the annals of financial disaster. That is one of the reasons why history is so complicated. It's full of folks who know some history. The historical narratives that we produce feed back into the history they purport merely to describe. That conversation I was referring to earlier, that cacophonous babble, adds another layer of cacophony because it begins to refer back to itself. People begin quoting themselves. They become knowing, self-conscious actors. That process is what we call history. It robs us of our innocence. It robs us of our position of neutrality. Any narrative that you produce feeds back into that layered babble. History, therefore, is fundamentally self-reflexive. But not only do they change history in the course of learning from it, the central bankers at the core of the drama, each time on our ascending curve, the forces involved in managing this process are different and larger and larger in scale. Controlling a spin in a biplane is not the same as saving a supersonic fighter jet. What they were struggling to stabilize in 2008 was a giant global trillion dollar financial machine.
It was a far bigger task than any crisis previously faced. But the crisis fighters did have one thing on their side. Not only were they clutching one important historical truth, lend, 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 they also had more freedom to do so. They had more freedom to act. Why? In the interwar period, their predecessors had been constrained by the gold standard on the one hand and mass political forces on the other. The 1930s was still a world of radical politics in the classic sense. Communism and old school leftism on the one hand, fascism and actual diehard 19th century conservatism on the other. By 2008, all of that was gone. Since the breakdown of the Bretton Woods currency systems between 1971 and 73, when Richard Nixon, the US president, unhooked the dollar from gold, and then the other currencies broke from the dollar, no major money in the world was any longer pegged to gold. We entered a world of fiat money. It's a hugely underrated discontinuity in human affairs that in the millennia-long history of money, this is the first moment. We are the first people to live in a world in which that monetary system is no longer anchored on a material base. The terrifying thing about that is that it makes money a matter of politics explicitly. And that's all the more worrying if, as in the 1970s, you actually still have active socialist militants and a powerful labor movement on your left wing. The deepest fear of every conservative under those circumstances is inflation. And inflation is precisely what broke out immediately following the end of the Bretton Woods currency system in the 1970s. Inflation threatens the stability of one of the basic pillars of the political and social order, money. What was needed was a synthesis of policy, which for some reason we label neoliberal, though it would be far better described, I think, as neoconservative. It was a way of abandoning the gold standard, the archaic promise of solidity that could no longer be made to work, and yet not ending up in anarchic monetary hell. The answer was delivered by Paul Volcker's Fed with its brutal interest rate shock in 1979. To measure the scale of the interest rate increase inflicted on the world economy unilaterally by the American Central Bank in the late 70s, you really need a long time scale, longer than the history of the United States. So here's one of the longest in financial history. This is British bank interest rates all the way back to the founding of the Bank of England in the 1690s. And that spike there is the Volcker interest rate shock of the late 70s and the early 1980s. Since that moment, we have built an apparatus of institutional structures to achieve one purpose, to insulate money from politics, from democratic party politics. Central bank independence became the norm. What that meant de facto was the freedom of largely conservative central bankers to pursue an anti-inflationary policy. An abrogation of democracy, no less significant and functionally important than the independence of the judiciary. Once again, this depended on the will of central bankers to push this through, but also on a fundamental shift in the underlying conditions of political economy in our modern societies, above all, the weakening of organized labor, the crushing of the trade union movement in the course of the 1980s. This, and again, it's an astonishingly dramatic graph, is the, are the statistics of labor disputes in the United States. I believe last year was the first year in the record of American labor statistics in which there were basically no strikes counted in the United States in 2018. Deindustrialization and the pressure of global competition helped to affect this shift in balance. But Volcker's high interest rates in 1979, as he's reminded us rather candidly in his memoirs, which came out very recently, delivered the death blow squeezing the life out of heavy industrial blue-collar communities across the world. By the 1990s, the new dispensation had proven its capacity to contain inflation. It was what Ben Bernanke famously called the great moderation. What it in fact turned out to contain was not inflation, of course, but surging inequality and gigantic credit fueled financial expansion. 2008, however, revealed the capacities built into this system. Because what was needed in 2008, in a situation in which we were faced not with inflation but deflation, was precisely what independent central banks were in a position to deliver, namely massive discretionary action on an epic scale. From justifying central bank independence as a measure of discipline against discretion, it became instead the license and the framework for massive action. This was the freedom gained by the shift to what was in effect political money placed now at the service of the stability of the system.
you could make money on demand, and the banks needed a lot of it. Central bankers weren't the only ones, of course. Treasuries and parliaments acted as well, but more immediate and fast acting than anything else was the gigantic expansion of central bank balance sheets. And crucially, the United States Federal Reserve stepped up as the global lender of last resort. Remember back to before the crisis, when we were focused on China and its rise, many people expected the imminent demise of the dollar world. They expected the playing out of a scenario like this, in which resulted in a collapse of the value of the dollar. The reverse happened after 2008. The US central bank reasserted itself in the course of the crisis as the hub of the global financial system. Not an imploding dollar, but the dollar as Superman. Emerging markets depend as ever on the flow of dollar credits. With or without Trump, the dollar still frames the global order. And my narrative ends with a look at the near miss China crisis of 2015, 2016, all too easily forgotten amidst the political turmoil in the West in those years. 2015, 2016 matters because we witnessed then the altogether unexpected spectacle of a run out not on the dollar into the Chinese currency, but out of the Chinese currency into dollars as she cracked down and the Chinese miracle looked as though it might stall. Crash brought the story right up to the end of 2017. It was not so much in the end a 10-year anniversary history of 2008 as a history of the 10 years since the crisis, blow by blow. And I blame history for how long the book became. It just didn't stop. But for all that, it's deeply shaped by its origin as a book to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Lehman crisis. And applying my own stern logic, if the 1930s are not the most illuminating bit of history with which to compare the present, can we be sure that 2008 is? My answer, and I mean this seriously, is that it probably is not. At the very least, one would have to recognize that a book centered on the specific logics that issued from the crisis of 2008 is at the very least a deeply incomplete guide to the present. I didn't see our present moment coming any more than anyone else. I was surprised by Brexit and Trump. And if one were to set out to write a history to illuminate the present that we do today, I am not sure you would start in 2008. It would form a chapter, of course, but you might not start there. You wouldn't certainly end there. You would want to take on the urgent issues of the present. You would want to write the history of oligopolistic tendencies that were extreme on Wall Street, but they're even worse in tech. You would want to address the central issue of inequality. You would want to address the radical shift in the pattern of global trade. You would need to address squarely the rise of China, which was not the hub of the crisis in 2008, but dominates our present horizon. Its rise represents the greatest shift in human affairs we've seen in generations. It's the most gigantic increase in production that the world has ever seen in its entire economic history. And it drives us with spectacular speed towards the horizon of climate change of dramatic proportions. A problem that was first discerned as serious in the 1980s and now it appears immediately pressing. A problem furthermore to which the West contributed but in which we are now no longer able to determine our future because China already accounts for more CO2 output than Europe and the United States put together. The implication of that is that the West has to come to terms with the fact that in the greatest challenge that humanity faces in the present, we are at most, in the most optimistic scenario, cooperative bystanders in a drama that will be decided by the decisions of the Chinese and the Indians. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not apologizing for crashed in conclusion. I'm simply returning to where I began. This, I think, is the specific responsibility of historians if we seek to contribute to informed public debate. Our role should not be to burnish our little nuggets of timeless wisdom or one or other period to which we are dearly attached and to insist on its relevance to the present. Our role should be, I think, to awaken a sense for historicity itself the inexorable, inescapable pressure of actuality that constantly outdates all of our knowledge, that forces us to confront the fact that we are on a continuously changing scenario, a continuously changing scene. That seems to me the true challenge of contemporary history if you take it seriously. The horizon shifts all the time. At a moment of crisis, it shifts literally day by day. And so we constantly need new histories. And it's in that spirit that I'm delighted and humbled to accept the Lionel Gelber Prize for Crashed as an encouragement, I hope, to future prize winners to take on that challenge and to give us those new histories that we constantly and desperately need.
Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Professor Tews, for a lively and fascinating talk, an outstanding book and an outstanding talk. Uh, just to get us started, I think the book points out fairly convincingly that the responses articulated in 2008, above all the United States, resulted in a massive asset inflation, which hugely exacerbated an extant trend towards inequality across the West. And that's where we are today, and that's part of the reason, though your, your story is a complex one, of why we have the orange men in, in the White House. So I, I wonder what could we have done differently in 2008? So with the benefit of historian and benefit of, of perspective, what should they have done to, to have saved the system but avoided that, that great upsurge in inequality? Well, I think on the, I think on the one hand, that's a, a <laughs> an absolutely legitimate question and an important one and an urgent one. But on the other hand, I also feel the modesty of a historian when faced with the complexity and difficulty of the circumstances that the actors are in that sure. have to act. And so I say use, use that as a proviso to start with. Um, one of the things that emerges if you talk to veterans of the Obama administration is that they themselves have regrets about several things. Um, the most obvious th is that they wish they punished somebody, hmm. or at least they wish they had been seen or could have appeared to be serious about punishing somebody. After all, in the end, we live under the rule of law, so punishing people isn't quite as simple as we might like sometimes. And the problem with the financial crisis is that the vast majority of the really serious damage was not done by people doing illegal things. That's, you know, in a sense, a piece of liberal ideology. In fact, they were done by people doing completely regular things, mm -hmm. but just very high risk. Yeah. And so that is one of the dilemmas, the desire for punishment and the difficulty of actually delivering it in practice. Um, and that, I think, is something that you hear them, in a sense, cogitating on what could, have we, done, what could we have done differently. The other great might have been um, in the calculus of the Obama administration, and I think it's on them that the questions really center, because to put it perhaps unfairly, but not unfairly, but just the Europeans are so far away from the possibility frontier of what they might have been able to do that to ask these kind of questions is just is not reasonable. Yeah. Um, it, the Eurozone economic policy is a disaster. Uh, that can't be said in a simple sense for the Obama administration. They stopped the crisis. The question we're talking about is how they could have done it even better, and in a way which, in a complex way, might have shifted the political balance. And I want to come back to that at the very end. Um, the other thing that they discuss is the question of whether in organizing the recovery, they could have focused more on the 10 to 20 million American households that were suffering acute mortgage stress instead of channeling support towards the banks. And in their defense, they will say that they worked every conceivable angle of this question as hard as the very best policy wonks of the Democratic Party could go. And they never could find a, to them, convincing answer to this question. And so instead, concluded that the most efficient way of solving the problem was the roundabout mechanism of saving Wall Street so as to save Main Street, mm -hmm. rather than attempting to save Main Street directly. And that, I think, is a judgment which they will have to live with for the rest of their lives, because that, I think, is the most obvious question that they face and that they don't really have a very good answer for. Why was there no more direct effort to support those households? Especially since we know through the legal proceedings that were brought above all by state attorney generals, with painful delays into 11, 12, 13, we know that there was a great deal of mis-selling, some of it borderline criminal, that did indeed affect millions of households mm -hmm. who were to that extent not simply the victims of miscalculation, but were in fact the victims of malpractice and could in that sense have been legitimate, legitimate, legitimate recipients. They will say in their defense that all of this kind of Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, backseat driving, that you have to understand the fierce political constraints they were operating under. The Obama administration felt basically it had enough political capital to carry two major measures in the first phase of the administration. And the first was the stimulus, which is a very large stimulus by American historic and global standards and makes a big difference. The questions we asked there is why wasn't it even bigger? And I think that's a legitimate question. Their answer is political capital. We'd asked for two trillion people would have lasted us in Congress. And we wanted to do one other thing, 
And the question really is what that other thing should be. And as we know, famously, they opted for health care. And they thought, basically, that by committing their political capital to health care, they would make a biggest difference to the American working class than any other measure that they could adopt. And I think there's reason for thinking that they're basically accurate assess in that assessment. Mm -hmm. That, of course, begs the question of what the political pressure they were under. And we just have to reckon with the incredible ferocity, the bare knuckles partisanship of the Republican Party in its dealings with the, with the Obama administration. I mean, this was a party which already denied support to the Bush administration, but didn't deliver a single vote for the stimulus at a time when Americans were losing jobs at the rate of more than half a million jobs a month. It's an extraordinary act of partisanship at that mm. moment. And that brings me to the final point, which relates back to the source of your question. I'm not sure that any of this, in a very direct way, explains Trump's success, certainly not in terms of rallying his troops. Where this kind of disillusionment may really play a role is in the fact that Democratic voters didn't turn out for Hillary in 2016. Yeah. The, the Trump voters themselves are not furious that the Obama administration didn't do more for American households and ordinary Americans. On the contrary, the Tea Party mobilized precisely against that possibility. The Tea Party is not a mobilization of disappointed liberals who think that the too much was done for Wall Street. It's a mobilization of anti-welfare, anti-big government Americans who don't want to see a progressive democratic administration headed by a black man extending the reach of welfare in the United States. It's quite classical anti-government, anti-welfare right-wing politics. And there's not much the Obama administration could have done about that, but it could at least have, if you like, bolstered its working class base mm. amongst hard-pressed communities and perhaps produced a better outcome for Hillary in 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, particularly in a country which subsidizes housing to such a superlative yeah. degree yeah. anyway. Yeah. Well, that leads perfectly into one of our written uh, questions, your comment on the Republicans. Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around when it comes to the crisis and its origins, while Republicans and Europeans correctly receive their fair share of criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, Democrats from Rubin uh, to Geithner, as well as the Fed, have a much easier time. Can you elaborate on this? Are they the heroes of, of your story? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, let's just, uh, let's just first of all lay out the, the basis for that point, um, which is that there is no doubt at all that the key, there is a continuity of economic policy making within the Democratic Party that goes back to the Clinton era and is centered on the figure of Robert Rubin, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, who becomes the charismatic head of Clinton's treasury at a time when America is already dealing with the Mexican crisis, the East Asian financial crisis, and Russia. So he is part of that triptych of the Committee to Save the World, uh, along with Larry Summers and Alan Greenspan on the front cover of Time in the late 1990s. So he's, a, he's not a Panglossian neoliberal who thinks that everything's fine, because they have him constantly to put out the fires. But he is the author, the granddaddy, really, of a centrist Democratic Party political economic agenda. Uh, they were the people who scripted the China problem as the central problem of the United States before the crisis. So they misunderstand the crisis of 2008. It's a very convenient stick to beat the Republicans with because you can link Bush's terrible wars in Iraq to the fiscal deficit and the tax cuts. And that explains why America ends up in hock to China. So there's a whole package. And despite the fact that their diagnosis is fundamentally wrong, and despite the fact that Rubin, by this point, is perched in Citigroup, which is probably the most dangerous bank in the United States over this period, um, the recruitment of the personnel for the Obama administration is run out of the offices of Citigroup on a Citigroup email. It's absolutely astonishing. They actually compiled the lists on a distributor of, of the bank, which was at the heart, really, of the most dangerous problem. Mm -hmm. So, and the kind of agenda that comes out of that, not surprisingly, is extraordinarily conformist and prioritize, prioritizes rescuing Wall Street. Um, I don't think there's any way of getting around that fact. Uh, and furthermore, the political support for the first phase of crisis fighting uh, 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 under Bush was carried by those centrist uh, Democrats, by Byrd and Pelosi, um, because they won majorities in Congress in 2006. And the Republicans have gone AWOL. They're not willing even to do the basics. And so through force of circumstance, through the networks they had built, through very concerted manipulation of the field of possible plausible, serious people, if you like, this group has dominated, for better and worse, Democratic Party policy making. So everything that we just said, 
in other words, how ambiguous this bailout ad, what its limits were, what its successes were, applies to that group because they are indeed its fathers and they are largely fathers. The only woman who really penetrated into that group, or rather didn't, was Christina Roma, who comes from a more left Keynesian or just Keynesian background in Berkeley. And uh, un, let's say, one of the more gossipy memoirs of the, Bush, uh, the Obama administration describes the rather masculinist, let's say, West Wing kind of atmosphere where bonding was largely organized around basketball games to which you know, women were not invited. Mm. And uh, there's a sense, I think, of a kind of clubbish closure of centrist uh, Rubenite economic policy. Mm. So for better or worse, they, they do indeed, I think, carry the can. Uh, it's very difficult to avoid a kind of sociological network analysis as a basic tool for understanding this. It makes you sound as though you're in the business of conspiracy theory. But I think this crisis is a crisis which dramatically expose the networks of power and leaves us with no option to be, but to talk in, in talks of those terms. Again, if you speak to those people, and that was partly what was influencing, the, influencing this, speaking to, say, Peter Orshark, the former Buzzard director of the Obama administration, he said to me, frankly, everything that we took for granted in the 1990s, in other words, the entire Rubenite agenda and mantra, should be up for grabs now. <laughs> so they understand how severely that has been shaken and how serious that what a serious challenge that presents for the Democratic Party now. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, let's move on to some of your comments on the, um, uh, the Eurozone crisis, the disaster. And very, very early on in, in the book, with the first 20 pages, you talk about millions of people thrust into poverty unnecessarily. And uh, the Germans don't come out of, well out of your book, come out of your book very well. I mean, they didn't come out of wages obstruction very well either, but you sort of expected that more. So in this book, they come out, the Germans come out very badly. So the, the blame kind of rests with, uh, the blame rests with Berlin. And I want to link something that, I know neither of us is in Britain, but we hear all the time in the Wexit, Brexit debate, too much of the will of the people, this mm. constant phrase that's thrown out. It wasn't the German position unavoidable, uh, really for two reasons. One, what was extended to Southern Europe was a package. Mm -hmm. You get our low interest rates overnight, which launched this huge boom. But you also have to take the discipline mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. That was pretty clear from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as, as you know, and perhaps everyone in the room knows, the Germans didn't want the Italians, the Spanish, the Portuguese, God help us, the Greeks in. This was a political decision driven in large measure by Paris. But it was also fundamentally democratic grounded. I mean, the Germans said, we're giving up the Deutsche Mark, mm -hmm. however, with conditions. Mm -hmm. So how, how, with any democratic credibility mm. could the Germans mm. not have taken the position they did. And indeed, as you point out rightly, Merkel managed to move slowly but surely mm. away from that, and we ended up with quantitative easing. So let me make three points. Mm. First of all, to emphasize the seriousness. Um, uh, you know, when I'm speaking to North American audiences, you, you, you have to make comparisons. I'm not going to, I mean, for, for Americans, this is particularly important. I'm sure Canadians, particularly this audience, have a wider outlook. But, you know, Spain is not a small problem. It's the size of Texas. Uh, Italy is not a small problem. It's the size of California. Uh, imagine United States politics if California and Texas had 30% unemployment rates amongst their young people. Just imagine for a moment what American politics would look like if that was the case. Not African-American minority populations in disadvantaged neighborhoods. 30% of everyone coming out of the public education system faces unemployment. This, is a, this, is a, this warrants a description as a tragedy. It is a catastrophe. It is an extraordinary puzzle to me how Europeans are at all surprised about the loss of legitimacy if you basically fail to satisfy that essential criteria. Right? The next thing to say is if I do diagnose a fault on the German side, I hope I'm at pains to stress that I don't think of it necessarily as a peculiar German phenomenon. In some sense, and it yes. segues directly from what we were just talking about, I think of the Germans as the last Rubenites. I mean, what the Germans are doing, fiscal stability over the long run, mm. independence of central banks, non-discretionary fiscal policy, this is the mantra of 1990s transatlantic common sense. Their question to everyone else is, how have you lost your heads? Like, what on earth are you doing? Exactly as you say, this was the deal. Everyone understood this was the deal, right? That's indeed the problem. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I spent the most formative years of my life 20 of them in Germany, I, I, I write a criticism of Germany, which to my great pleasure, and it's one of the great satisfactions of having produced this book, has been received in this spirit. Not as your usual anglophone uh, dismissive critique of Germany, mm -hmm. but as an inside argument aimed at the soft spots of their position. And 
And one the crucial thing is not to other them. I don't think of them as other at all. I think of them as dogmatically holding on to an orthodoxy which other people let go. So that is really the question. Why weren't they more pragmatic? Why can't they see the very damaging consequences of the policies they pursued, not just for the Greeks, but for everyone in the Eurozone? Germany, believe it or not, could be even better off than it is, right? And I agree with you fundamentally that the, the German position is absolutely massively democratically legitimated. So the criticism such as it is has got to be couched, not as it were as a technocracy versus democracy argument, but as an argument internal to democracy, which is simply to say that Germany's political leadership has been lamentably unimaginative in explaining to the German population the bigger positive mm. sum game that needs to be played out here. Sure. It's completely legitimate for Merkel to sit on her stubborn little island and pursue this policy and get lots of votes for doing it. Sort of. She's not actually been all that successful in doing that. It hasn't really panned out. You can hardly say that the Germans have managed to stabilize their democratic system. It's been productively destabilized, both on the left and the right. Yeah. You can say that, and it's totally fine. And so the book at no point really argues technocracy versus democracy. Mm. If anything, I have a sneaking sympathy for technocratic solutions in the face of that kind of unimaginative democracy. If that's your kind of democratic leadership you've got, then give me an imaginative central bank, mm. which is indeed what we've ended up with and what Merkel in effect did, which is to hold the German right wing at bay while Draghi acted. Yeah. That has been Merkel's single most significant contribution to Eurozone stabilization. And, and, and so we need to think, this is why for me Keynes is the great, ought to be the great hero of an imaginative and optimistic liberal politics because he understands precisely this. The problem cannot be just as it were technocracy in an age of democracy that doesn't work. Nor, however, should we in any point want to rely on a, you know, a democratic demos to consistently yield constructive outcomes. When I said central bank independence is a little bit analogous to, to the independence of the judiciary, I meant it. And that, after all, is a principle that the vast majority of us would want to support. We wouldn't want these kind of fundamental issues of law being adjudicated simply by a democratic vote. I speak also of somebody, of course, agonized by the Brexit outcome, so you can yeah. hear the anti plebiscitary animus. In my oh, yeah, I appreciate the converted here. No, no, fair points. I say one of the things I like very much about your book is, unlike sort of a Krugmanite literature, you explain the German position very well <laughs> before, my, before yeah. you. So let me just let me add one more it. thing just to show how perverse this is. Where do they get their fiscal non their non discretionary fiscal politics from? Why do they think they ought to run low debt positions? Because they, they've created this toxic a uh, segue between environmental discourses of sustainability, which we, of course, all applaud the Germans for, and fiscal conservatism. You know? So it's as though you know, the fantasy we have of American evangelicals owning the climate change issue because they're supposed to be looking after God's creation. That's essentially what's happened in Germany. They, they treat fiscal policy as a question of environmental sustainability. The Green Party is fiscally conservative. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's really a melange. There's no simple position there. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. So your, your comments on uh, central banks leads us right up into the next one. One is, you know, how healthy is our, our current position? Are we heading for another crisis? And take that if you will. But I think this question you probably uh, might want to answer, is the Fed capable of, of thwarting another crisis if we're hit with one? Yeah, this is the really interesting question that is being debated uh, in Washington, Soto Voce, in all sorts of different places, and you get radically different answers depending on who you talk to. In fact, you can get different answers from the same person depending on, on, on what's going on in the Trump administration. The basic question is, just to make clear what the stakes are, if the survival of global capitalism in 2008 depended on precisely one of those technocratic fixes, in other words, behind the scene, the America's National Central Bank repurposed itself as a global stabilizer. And it had, in its back pocket, a defense of this position. In other words, if we don't save Deutsche Bank, the blowback to America is so large and so unpredictable, we have to act. But they were never forced to test that in an open court. They were never really held to account by Congress for what they did. It just happened. What we know subsequently is that with Dodd-Frank, the move was to constrain Fed discretion. And I think given the balance of political forces in Congress, it's really quite difficult to know whether or not the Fed, if push came to shove, would really get the political backing. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, and I really had sort of some hesitation about doing this, thanks to the work of troublesome historians who pointed out, pointed out the significance of the swap lines, any Tom, Dick, or Harry who happens to want to know about what the Fed did in the crisis wouldn't have to Google very much to find it. Whereas in 2008, 9, 10, it was quite buried as an issue 
It's now, frankly, front and center. Everyone knows about swap lines. Mm. And that is not necessarily helpful from the point of view of the politics of stabilization. Obviously, normatively, no one would really want to endorse a situation in which a key element of stabilization systematically avoids the test of public opinion. But unless we have plausible and credible political leadership to do the work of translating this, if you like, to explain the linkages between not just Wall Street, but global finance and Main Street, mm. we've, got a, we've got a real problem. And, and I think that's, that is indeed a, a question. Uh, there are a bunch of more technical answers, which is, is their balance sheet already too large and are interest rates too low? But that's the stuff of the debate in Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times yeah. every day. Um, we're certainly not in the position where we are in 2007, 8, where there was lots of interest rates that you could lower. I don't think the balance sheet per se is an issue. Look at the Bank of Japan or you know, the Swiss National Bank. Mm. You can blow those things up to an extraordinary extent. Um, but interest rates don't give us the same margin of movement that we've had before. Yeah, because yeah, they're basically zero. Yep. So I'll read this out, but you're not going to answer this question. What are the top three common factors of all uh, financial crises by the book? And you'll see the answer to that one. Plus, you know me. I don't like those kind of generalizations from history about the top three factors. Of <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you might tease it out of the book. So buy a copy of the book, get a signature, and, and get started. Um, so this, this uh, picks up on sort of the last section of, of the book, um, the, uh, the relationship between um, the lack of accountability for the crash, uh, the fact that you know, no one went, went to prison, makers of cars go to prison, when they cheat on their emissions, but uh, bankers haven't gone to, to, to prison. Uh, the connection between all of that, so I, I think not so much the crash, the fact that no one paid for it, mm. the relationship between that on the one hand and right-wing populism and intergenerational resentment on the other. Right. I, I, I'll just I'll emphasize this again. I think there is a real sleight of hand in arguing, and it's an argument overwhelmingly made from the left, so it's a particularly shaped sleight of hand, which says, Surely everyone's upset about the injustices of the bailout. Uh, these people who voted for Trump, I want to understand them. So I'm going to impute to them the kind of upsetness that I understand, <laughs> which is that kind of upsetness. So I bet that's why they voted for Trump, because otherwise they're perfectly reasonable people. And if only we had done the bailout differently, then they wouldn't have made this terrible mistake of voting for Trump. That, I think, is sort of the chain of logic there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's totally unpersuasive to me. Um, it is a very good explanation of why people are supporting Bernie Sanders. That, for them, it's straight through. That is indeed the Sanders war cry. That the 2016 election on the left was about 2008 in precisely that way. Um, it isn't a convincing explanation of why people vote for Trump, um, because that isn't the logic of that argument. I mean, people don't, I mean, the, the, there's a sense, perhaps, that the democratic establishment can't be trusted and that that's why you vote for Trump. But it isn't that fully fleshed out chain of logic of the type that we've, that we've just spelled out there. I mean, the, the Trump swing is not very large, and it's largely explained, I think, by various types of nationalist rhetoric yep. and appeals to xenophobia harnessed to an economic nationalism, plus his counter-mainstream cultural affect. Like, there is a substantial body of American voters that want to vote for a man that's that obnoxious yeah, to folks yeah. like us. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's, that's why they want to vote for him, because... They, I mean, this is the, the you know, what's, the, what's wrong with cancer's argument? Yeah. Uh, you know, they disdain us and they know that we disdain them. Yeah, yeah. No, and I thought you, you, you demonstrated that very effectively in the book, providing the evidence that, of course, the, the poorest, the most deprived voted for the Democrats, yeah. voted for Clinton. Because uh, minorities not, not do, Trump. right? I mean, yeah. the Democratic electorate um, has a lot grip on the minorities, and those are the systematically most disenfranchised, disadvantaged no, no, people an, in the United uh, States. Absolutely, an ugly national resentment, a desire for a world in which straight white men had all, all yeah. the power, absolutely. Um, so this goes on to this, this question of the US as the world's reserve uh, currency, mm -hmm. and I'm going to plagiarize a colleague who's in the room, but you're not allowed to identify yourself because I want credit for this question. Um, on the one hand, in the book, you talk about the shift to Asia, the shift to China. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, both the story of the book and this fascinating chart you put up here on the dollar show that the US remains, to mm -hmm. quote Obama, the indispensable nation, yeah. the anchor of it all. Yeah. So is that really changing? Or I, it, yeah. Sir, please go ahead. No, I mean, I think what we need to do to account for our current situation is just allow for the fact that globalization of these kind of shifts are massively complex. 
Right? I, I, it's one of the reasons I, for instance, don't use the term financialization much in the book, because it takes the complexity of economic and social development and compresses it into one term. Mm. You know, now we're all being asked to believe that we're in an age of surveillance capitalism. You know, this is going to be the age of Asia. There is this extraordinary, uh, it's, uh, in Greek you know, literary analysis, it's called synecdoche, right? Where you compress the whole into a single thing. No, right? it's called political science. Well, well yeah. Okay. But, you know, the sails of the approaching ships stand for Athens. Or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and that is hugely compelling as political rhetoric. And it's very persuasive in a certain sort of academic argument. But I just don't find it a satisfactory account of the complexity that we face. So I think it's simultaneously true that... The manufacturing base of the world has shifted to East Asia in a way we've never, ever seen before. And at the same time, the soft tissue of the global financial system is totally dollar-centric. It's simultaneously true that the Chinese have a huge trade surplus, and their private sector likes to borrow in dollars, because dollars have really low interest rates, or had in the age of QE, very low interest rates. Mm. So the best carry trade was to borrow in dollars, buy a bunch of raw materials, use those as collateral for a loan in Huan, and then you made money each way, right? So you, the interest rates were lower than in China, the commodities went up in price, and um, the currency moved so that the yuan appreciated against the dollar and you made money on the currency trade, right? So you could, and the result of that, however, is a world in which China has a huge trade surplus, its government has a huge dollar surplus, and its private sector in 2015 was estimated to owe $1 trillion in American money. That's the kind of complexity that we face. Hmm. Add tech as another layer. Add oil and energy as another layer. Add the life sciences as a further layer. It seems to me if you're not operating with a... And then they add the global labor market. You operate, if you're not operating with a five or six dimensional notion, you're basically flattening the reality and the complexity of what we face here. And so America continues to be dominant unambiguously in two key dimensions. One is the centrality of the dollar to the global financial system. It's the only issue of, essentially of safe reserve, of the safe assets. And the other one is hard power. And mm. those two dimensions remain constants. Both of them are being nibbled away at in various ways, but they remain massively fixed. Yeah, OK. I'm going to end with this su summarize of some of the last kind of a, a Canadian question. If you grew up, you're lucky you didn't grow up in the 70s in Canada because we had CanCon rules, which is so many songs on the radio had to be Canadian. And mm. therefore, you know, you had to turn it off every third song mm. and mm. turn it up again when the wretched song that no one else would listen to if they didn't have to was over. So this is the Canadian question. But there's no CanCon rules here. I just want to ask it. Um, the striking thing living in this, in this country, and for anyone in this room, is that you felt like there was this storm around you, and you were more or less mm. safe from it. You know, there, there was no banking crisis, there were no bailouts, the housing market mm. didn't collapse. Mm. So is what we need sort of the Canadianization of the world? And by, what I mean by that, what I, I'm sure there's nationalists in the room. What I mean, what I mean by that, though, is, is a much more highly seems it was a regulatory failure, a much more highly regulated, particularly mortgage system where there, there isn't mortgage relief, there's much stricter limits on borrowing, there's no subprime market at all. No, that's why I'm absolutely not fatalistic. Uh, I, it seems to me that the solution to this particular problem, anyway, when we're talking about finance, is, is, not, is not rocket science. It's neither politically nor intellectually difficult to figure out what needed to be done. It is a matter of the mobilization of key constituencies to stabilize it and to make it work. Mm. Um, it is, however, also finance the easiest global problem. Because in the end, money is an artifact, as I was saying, of law and of politics. It's only that, right? It's basically an artifact of those most malleable human institutions. Um, so much more problematic is something like decarbonization, yeah. where Canada's position is far more ambiguous. <laughs> no, there you um, don't want the Canadianization so, of the world. No, and I mean that yeah. extremely seriously. It goes back to this multidimensional account of globalization yeah. and its problems. Yes, there is no doubt at all that, say, with regards to, I don't know, uh, national health insurance, there are kind of some no-brain options out there that some countries, for their own perverse reasons, fail mm. to adopt. But that shouldn't really trouble, you know, those aren't the sort of things that keep me up at night. You can be frustrated at the failure of that country to adopt an obvious solution. And I think that's a reasonable response to 2008. This is another way of rephrasing my own impatience with myself that we're celebrating a book about the financial crisis. Mm. Like, that's the easy problem. Uh, and it should gall us to you know, an extraordinary extent that that easy problem was allowed to preoccupy us for the extent that it was and was allowed to do as much damage hmm. as it was when we actually face huge problems. 
And the most serious of them all is evidently the imbrication of industrial civilization and absolutely everything physical in this room, from our clothing to our furniture to the lighting to the heat to the food we're going to eat and the drink, whatever, with a totally unsustainable uh, material model of production. Yeah. That's a, a just an unthinkably difficult problem. Um, and for me, the most surreal moment of the entire experience of doing this book, and I'll end with this, with this anecdote, was doing a bunch of radio conversations uh, with the West Coast of the United States in the fall of 2008. And, uh, you know, the guy published this new book about the financial crisis, and so the conversation always ends up, are you ready? So where's the next crisis going to come from? And they'll say, Professor Tooze will be back with that after the break. Uh, <laughs> and we'll, no, and then they'll say, and then we'll have the weather. And the weather forecast is, well, it will be a beautiful day, but for the fact that the sun is entirely obscured by the smoke produced by massive forest fires. Now, back to Professor Tooze and mm. the question of where the next crisis is coming from. <laughs> that was, for me, like, that. why the hell are we talking about this book? I mean, mm. And I mean that in all you know, seriousness. So the, and it's a historical dilemma. I don't, I don't mean that we shouldn't talk about the financial crisis, but, but the fact that we are is itself a kind of meta-statement about the perversity of our circumstances. Absolutely. Nicely said. Well, Professor Tews, thank you for a uh, fascinating talk, and congratulations again on a well-deserved prize. Thank you. <laughs>